Yeah, today we want to talk about uh, pesticide resistance. Now, sometimes when we apply these pesticides using the correct uh, dosage, they may fail to kill the pesticide. Uh, sorry, the, the, the pest. And this can uh, take place over uh, a period of using uh, the same uh, pesticides. So we want to talk about uh, what can happen to insecticides, uh, fungicides, and uh, herbicides. So let me share this uh, slide. So we want to talk about this uh, pesticide uh, resistance. Now, if uh, we start with the a population A, I've got the two populations A and the B. Now this population may have a background uh, mutation and the drift, uh, there could be changes within the population. Now, what is going to happen is that uh, if we introduce a pesticide here, there could be resistance because of this uh, population. Or we can start with this uh, population here. And we have resistance mutation uh, imaging. Initially in a single uh, genetic uh, background. Then when we introduce this uh, pesticide. Eventually, we have some uh, resistance, uh, resistant uh, populations. So what is uh, pesticide uh, resistance? The population of a single pest is made up of uh, biotypes of that organism. So the population may have some uh, differences. A biotype is the same organism, but is different uh, genetic uh, differences. So the population will have uh, some differences as far as the genetic makeup is concerned. Pesticide resistance is the natural ability of the biotype of an organism to survive exposure to a pesticide that would normally kill an individual of that uh, species. How does a resistance uh, okay? Now, this resistant uh, biotype uh, survives the repeated uh, pesticide exposure, and meanwhile, it is actually reproducing and building up uh, a new population. The pest organism's population may become dominated now by the resistant uh, biotype. 
Now, at this point, the pesticide is no longer useful and other management options must be used uh, if they exist. So resistance originates from the original uh, population, which is exposed to the pesticides. While the susceptible biotypes disappear in the presence of the uh, pesticide, the biotypes which resist will be building up until they form the new population. Uh, and eventually this population is going to extend uh, the pesticide. Now, if resistance is managed effectively, the pesticide remains useful uh, to growers. So what we are saying is that uh, some pesticides may be useful initially, but later on uh, they are no longer useful because of uh, resistance from the pests. Here I've got a, a pest. You can see we have got green uh, lava and the brown or reddish lava, just showing you that uh, within the population of a pest, you could have some uh, differences. Let's suppose the red one was uh, resistant we may remove all the green ones and they remain with uh, the red ones. And eventually they will give us uh, the problem. Now let us look at the effect of repeated use of a pesticide. Now using one type of pesticide over and over again can produce resistance in a population of insects, fungi, weeds, and other organisms. The offspring have the same genetic composition as their parents and are able to withstand the pesticide. So the pesticide is no longer usable as a viable method of pest management for this organism since the surviving biotype is now resistant to the pesticide. Now focusing on uh, insect uh, resistance, we know insecticides are used to control uh, insects the first uh, probably insect resistance to the synthetic uh, insecticides DDT was documented in 1947. And since that time, within two to 20 years of the release of new insecticides, key pests have been found with uh, resistance. This causes more frequent uh, application of the insecticide, probably in trying to manage the pest. Growers must ultimately switch pesticides as insect control diminishes. Because if you keep on using one pesticide, then it fails to control the pests. There's a need to change that uh, pesticide. Even in plant insecticides such as BT can be overcome by uh, insects. Now let us look at how insects become uh, resistant 
there are various uh, four ways. The first one is metabolic. Now the insect can clear its body of toxin or break toxin down quicker than other insects. So if you have got a resistant type, if it consumes the insecticide, that insecticide is going to be broken down inside that insect so that uh, it loses its toxicity. Uh, later on, we will talk about uh, metabolic uh, processes. Number two, it could be due to the target site where that uh, insecticide can affect. The insecticide can no longer connect at its target site at a molecular level in the insect. So there's now a mismatch of the insecticide and the target site. So the insecticide will fail to kill uh, the pest. Number three, it could be a question of availability, whether the pesticide is able to reach its site of action. So penetration, the insects share more slowly absorbs an insecticide. So it is the, the cuticle which can hold uh, the insecticide. Number four, it could be behavioral. Certain insects can sense or stay, stay clear of uh, insecticide uh, dangers. If you spray an insecticide, uh, the, some of the insects may avoid the sprayed areas. Uh, this can also contribute to uh, resistance. We will focus on some of the examples of uh, insecticide resistance. You know, we have got this marathon resistance. Marathon <coughs> Is, a, is an insecticide. Now, the resistance of marathon is caused by the increased levels of an enzyme called the carbo, carboxyesterase uh, in, the, in, in the aphids. So you may find that uh, marathon may fail to kill some of the aphids. Uh, because uh, they have this enzyme uh, in high levels, uh, carbo carboxyesterase. Uh, it is said that uh, resistance is heterozygous for two arrays, coding for increased carboxyesterase levels. So you may have a certain population with this enzyme at high levels and is not affected by marathion. A, mut a mutant form of carboxyesterase may also occur in resistant uh, insects. Now, this modified the enzyme may become capable of hydrolyzing uh, other kinds of uh, ester linkages of this uh, uh, insecticide. So, resistance in aphids could be due to high levels of uh, 
carboxy esterase in enzyme. Methyl parathion. Now this one is hydrolyzed by a resistant strain of potato aphid, uh, which is also rich in uh, carboxy carboxyl esters, but uh, not the susceptible uh, strain. Uh, which has got uh, low levels of this uh, enzyme. So it can also okay to meet uh, parathion resistance. This carboxyl esterase may also account for that uh, uh, resistance because it can cause breakdown of that uh, pesticide in the resistant uh, strains. Tetrachlorovinfos resistance. Uh, this now applies to flies uh, which have the resistance to this uh, insecticide. Now what happens uh, is that uh, with the resistant uh, strains there's a process known as dearculation, uh, which can uh, take place or which can alter the insecticide. Now this process can take place 120 times more than in susceptible uh, strains. That's how the resistant flies are protected. Because the alteration of the pesticide is very high uh, in the resistant uh, flies. Now, another enzyme which could also facilitate the breakdown of tetrachlorovinfos could be glutathione ace transferase, uh, which could be responsible for the resistance in the resistant uh, strains. We also have a carbamate uh, resistance. Now with the Carbamate, we've got the microsomal oxidation of the carbamates. Uh, in fact, uh, the breakdown of carbamates is uh, catalyzed by cytochrome P450. Later on, we'll talk about uh, metabolism of some of these uh, insecticides. Now, cytochrome P450 can increase the breakdown of uh, carbamates in resistant uh, insects than the susceptible ones. So this is just due to metabolism being assisted by the enzymes. So some of the resistance in insects is caused by breakdown of uh, the insecticides and this is caused by high levels of uh, enzymes which are involved in the metabolism of these uh, insecticides. We also have uh, organochlorine resistance This could be due to dehydrochlorinase enzyme, which can also facilitate breakdown of organochlorines in resistant uh, insects. So this could be also due to uh, metabolism. So 
So we have just talked about uh, how resistance can come about uh, in uh, insects. Now, how can we manage uh, resistance or how can we delay it uh, in, 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 in the pests? So let's talk about management of pesticide resistance in uh, insect uh, pests. Now in Zimbabwe, we've got uh, examples, especially in cotton, where resistance was actually still being managed uh, in cotton pests. Now in cotton, glowworms, Eriotis amigera, and the mites, Tetranica species, uh, these pests have potential to resist insecticides. Now, mites are controlled by a caricide rotation scheme where the pink borrowing was managed by a closed uh, season. I will explain uh, this. So, on the borrowing by uh, control, we have got borrowing insecticides. Uh, which should be alternated within a growing uh, season just to avoid uh, resistance. There's also the acaricide uh, rotation uh, scheme. There's also the closing season that when farmers should do slash uh, cotton. This, are, this is again done so that uh, we avoid the uh, resistance. Here on this uh, table, uh, we have what they call the close the season. In the southeast low veld and the bite bridge area, I think cotton should be slashed around one August. Uh, it should be destroyed around fifteen August, and the five October should be the earliest uh, planting date. So we are trying to avoid the cotton in the fields, so as to break down the life cycle of these uh, pests. And the remainder of the country, by 15 August, cotton should be slashed. 10 September, we should destroy uh, the cotton. And we should do plant probably by 20 October. There's also the rotation of pesticides uh, in cotton. Uh, this is done to slow the development of insecticide resistance. Uh, so we have borrowing insecticides uh, which are rotated. So synthetic pyrethroids are used in rotation with the conventional insecticides, mainly carbamet uh, group. The rotation of borrowing pesticides in Zimbabwe is called the pyrethroid uh, window. This window was developed by the Cotton Research Institute. 
uh, Department of Research and the Specialist Services. Now looking at the rotation of pesticides in cotton, pyrethroids must not be used in Zimbabwe before 25 December or after 1st March, that is in the southeast low veld. You can use uh, use of uh, pyrethroids is confined to the period from 1st February to end of growing season within non southeast low veld areas. That is the remainder of the country. Before and after these uh, periods, uh, conventional pesticides are recommended. So the idea is to break the usage, the continuous usage of one uh, pesticide so that uh, we avoid building up uh, resistant uh, biotypes. Yeah, again, I've got a table which is showing the pyrethroid uh, window. Here we've got the This is the middle veld. Where we have this period uh, beginning of the season to 1st February, we may use the conventional uh, insecticides. But from 1st February to end of season, we switch to pyrethroids. If we are in the southeast low veld, beginning of season to, to 24 December and the beginning of March to the end of season, we will be using conventional uh, uh, insecticides. But from 25 December to February, we should be using uh, pyrethroids. So the idea is to rotate insecticides to avoid the uh, build up of uh, resistant uh, insect pests. So these are the pyrethroids which are commonly used. Lambda, Silotrin, 5 EC, Fenvarinate, 20 EC, Fluvarinate, 2 EC, Dreta Methrin, 2.5 EC. So these are the pyrethroids. Now, for conventional borrowing chemicals, uh, we can switch to Cabri 85 WP, Thionex or Endosulfan 35 EC. Again, here I just have a table of various uh, uh, pesticides with common name, trade name, and the chemical group, we have got the organochlorine, carbamate, maybe being rotated by the pyrethroid. Now for red spider mite, diamethate was recommended for the control of this pest by Bretter 1986. 
However, by 1968, the red spider mites had developed the resistance uh, to dimethoate and closely related uh, organophosphates such as dimethyl S methyl and the thiomethyl. So we have had the problems with the red spider mite resistance in cotton. So what could have been the causes for resistance in the red spider mite? This could have been due to overexposure of the red spider mite to chemical stress. The other issue is something to do with the reproductive capacity of this red spider mite. There is a short generation turnover time, which is coupled with the fecundity. It can reproduce uh, within a short space of time. It can build in you know, large populations. Uh, an insect with such uh, traits uh, can easily become uh, resistant to pesticides. So in Zimbabwe, there was this acaricide rotation scheme, which was also introduced. Uh, this was introduced by Dan Kobe in 1973. So what they did was to divide Zimbabwe into three regions. So registered systemic or translaminar caricides were classified into three distinct chemical groups, among which cross resistance uh, was not likely to occur. So Zimbabwe was divided into this one, two, three uh, regions. So in these areas, this organophosphate group could be recommended like western low veld and eastern areas then we've got Mazoe valley and the north eastern areas we've got amitras etc then central and north western areas we've got this other chemical so this is an example of the acaricide rotation scheme uh, which was devised in Zimbabwe so that uh, we could reduce uh, the resistance of insect uh, pests. So these are the recommended the insecticides or acaricides. Uh, for the rotation scheme, we've got amitras, triazophos, prophenphos, tetradiphon, and the clofen, clofen pair. So these are the acaricides which can be used. So, in summary, we can say that uh, in Zimbabwe, we have experienced the uh, 
insect pest resistance, especially uh, in cotton, and there have been some uh, solutions to that uh, problem. Now we move on to fungicide resistance. I could not find a good examples of uh, fungicide resistance uh, in this country. Now, fungicide resistant strains are already in the population and are caused by probably natural mutations. So if you take a population of fungi, there are some strains with the resistance within that uh, population. As long as you are using the fungicides, you will build up a population of resistant uh, strains. Once that population is uh, high, you will come to a point where your fungicide simply doesn't work. It's not going to control uh, the resistant uh, mutants. So once the population of the resistant mutants is very high, uh, that is when you lose your fungicide uh, efficacy. Uh, the fungicide no longer works. It cannot prevent the uh, yield losses. Now, what really causes the fungicide resistance may be the fungi could possess alternative metabolic pathways to one targeted by the fungicide. The other reason is that uh, the fungus, uh, the fungi could do, have some enzymes which are able to degrade and inactivate the active ingredients in the fungicide. So there are two ways. The, fung uh, the fungi could have an alternative metabolic pathway or it has the capacity to destroy the fungicides. How do we manage or how do we avoid the fungicide resistance? We should try to follow recommended rates and also avoid unnecessary sprays. Whenever we see some disease development, it doesn't necessarily mean we should come and put a fungicide. We should also try to, rotate, to use different types of uh, fungicides or rotate fungicides. We should also involve other control methods which are not chemical and possibly try to follow integrated uh, approaches in controlling uh, the diseases. Maybe we could reduce the risk of uh, fungicide resistance. Yeah, I could not get a good example where, fungi, where fungal disease, uh, where we lost uh, control due to breakdown of, uh, I mean, due to, to, to a build up of resistant uh, populations. 
I could not find that good example which shows that uh, fungicides are no longer working. But there's an experiment which was done under Glasshouse uh, using fungal diseases in Blue Whale reported by Mutasa. Uh, it was reported that uh, first of Thora infestants uh, became uh, resistant to most of the fungicides with the exception of only one a DDAC uh, which controlled uh, the pathogens. Otherwise some of the fungicides uh, could not kill this uh, disease. Fusarium oxporium was also found to exhibit some level of resistance. Uh, this was a greenhouse uh, experiment reported in Bulue. So that was short for uh, fungicides or fung uh, fungicide resistance. Now let us now move on to talk about uh, weed resistance to herbicides. Again, I will mention here before we go into details that uh, in Zimbabwe we have not observe the weed resistance to herbicides. By that I mean that uh, if you apply the recommended rates, they fail to control weeds. However, worldwide, we have seen the reports of weed resistance actually rising. Probably the earliest reports were done just after the 1970s and they continue to increase. The blue areas on the world map are the countries where a lot of reports on weed resistance on herbicide resistance is being uh, reported. You can see that in South Africa, they are also now reporting uh, uh, herbicide resistance. Even in Saudi Arabia and Egypt, Ethiopia, they are also reporting it, Australia, China, Actually, most of the developed the countries. Here I've got a list of herbicide resistant weeds in Iowa, which is uh, US. We have got uh, herbicides associated with ALS inhibitors and also EPSPS inhibitors and all these other uh, targets. Now if you have a herbicide which is specifically targeted to a certain site, sometimes you get uh, resistance very early. But these examples are from outside Zimbabwe. Now, when susceptible weeds, which are normally killed after the application of the herbicide, it is the recommended rates survive. Uh, it means these weeds are resistant to the herbicide. Yeah, it should not be confused with the uh, 
calibration which is wrong, which can give rise to rates which are wrong, and we fail to control it. Uh, we were talking of when our calibration is good and we are doing the right thing, then we fail to control the weights. Now, this is a graph which is showing uh, how resistance uh, occurs. Now, with the time, it may actually increase. Yeah, we start with this uh, population of weeds. We spray the herbicide, maybe what is going to happen. weed will remain and that weed will produce seeds and increase the population now if we continue doing this we will build a population of resistant uh, weeds or a wild biotype, then at this stage, maybe the weeds won't be killed by the herbicides. Here we've got weeds which are being sprayed. Now during spraying, we kill the susceptible ones and leave the resistant. Uh, biotypes, which will eventually uh, form the population. And you are saying that uh, our selection pressure is the application of the herbicide. Now, if we examine the weed population, in a population of weeds, the frequency of weeds with resistant genes uh, represent a small proportion of the total population. The frequent use of the herbicide creates selection pressure on the population of weeds. So the population of resistant weeds will eventually increase and become the dominant uh, weeds. At this stage, the herbicide will fail to control uh, the weeds. But later on, you are going to find out that uh, it may not be as simple as this uh, with weeds. So these are some of the major weeds which have been found to be resistant in some areas. So let us say briefly talk about mechanisms of uh, resistance, wherever these have been reported. Uh, what can account for resistance could be the target site resistance. It could be the enzymes. It could be a change in the primary structure of the enzyme. Or it could be mutation, a single point mutation on the gene, some changes uh, which may take place on the genes may lead to resistance. Here I will just use a diagram just to illustrate a resistance. The first diagram shows good weed control. Here we have got our herbicide shaped with this triangle, which can nicely fit into this uh, gap. Once it does that, it can kill the wheat. But sometimes you have this alteration 
where the herbicide will fail to fit into this uh, gap, then uh, the herbicide will fail to express its mode of action. As a result, the plant, the plant survives. So you have uh, resistance. So this is a simple way of expressing it. This could do probably explain what can happen to acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase. Uh, acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase is, is the enzyme which can cause uh, resistance or we can write it in brief like this now this uh, acetyl coenzyme a gene has been uh, reported in uh, in grasses. Normally, there are some herbicides which kill grasses. We expect the grasses uh, to die, especially when we use herbicides from these groups, arinoxifinoxic carboxylic acids and the cyclohexin diodes. Sometimes we just talk of FOPs and DIMS. Now these grass killers, we expect them to kill Avida Fachua, but because Avida Fachua may possess this acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase, which is slightly altered, uh, is going to resist. Uh, these uh, herbicides. Also, acetolactate synthase. Uh, we have got the sulfonylurea and the midazolinones. These are a group of herbicides uh, which can uh, also kill some uh, grasses. But they can only kill if they can uh, combine with this uh, uh, enzyme. In other words, we are having this sort of uh, structure here. So that's why these herbicides will fail to kill grasses because they cannot fit into the acetolactate synthase. We also have photosystem 2 inhibitors. There have been some changes or mutation in the D1 protein. Therefore, atrazine may fail to kill some weeds due to trials in uh, resistance. Uh, photosystem 1, diverting a uh, herbicide. We may also have some detoxifying uh, oxygen uh, species. Whose oxygen may actually cause uh, death, but we have uh, other systems which prevent that. So we have enzymes like superoxide dismutase ascorbate reductase and glutathione reductase, uh, which will protect, uh, for example, conize, bonariensis, or conize species in immobilization of uh, paraquat. So these uh, enzymes may prevent uh, paraquat from killing a uh, conizer species.
they could be resistant to certain division uh, inhibitors, you know, trifluorine, which is a dinitroaniline. We know it should kill grasses, but sometimes it may fail to kill Elucine indica, Cetaria viridis, and the Sogam adipens due to the resistance uh, in these uh, weeds. Resistance to glyphosate. We have some uh, few reports of weed resistance, especially Elucine indica in Malaysia. where there's inhibition of EPSP synthase by glyphosate. But uh, we may have uh, a lucine indica which can produce twice as much uh, EPSP synthase so that it can carry out its normal function. So it's not disturbed by glyphosate. There's also resistance to oxygen type herbicides, macroprop, for example, to chickweed. Now we have got herbicide which becomes immobile in resistant weeds. For example, MCPA and 24D, it may they may fail to, to, to move within the resistant weeds, like what was reported in New Zealand. The other thing which can uh, cause the weed to survive or to resist is what is known as enhanced metabolism resistance where you have the weed which is endowed with a lot of cytochrome P450s, glutathione S transferase, and these could be involved in breaking down uh, the pesticides. So if we use another model again, this can fit nicely into that and cause a plant death. But if this, when it comes there, it's broken into two or it is a different shape, then there could be resistance. This is just a, a model. We can have enhanced activity of P450 in some weeds. Also, the role of GSTs in the metabolism of atrazine, alacro, and metalacro. This can cause breakdown of uh, herbicides and cause some weeds to survive. There's also what is known as enhanced decompartmentalism. This is a, the process where the herbicide is restricted in one area of the plant. This is possible because of the ATP binding cassette, ABC transporter which moves xenobiotic or herbicide substances from cytoplasm to cell vacuole. So these poisonous herbicides are put somewhere where it is safe or compartmentalized or restricted in the vacuole.
there would also be a rapid conjugation uh, with a glutathione. And then these are moved into the vacuole. So like here, this can fit into that and cause death. Or this one is supposed to fit there, but it will be uh, deposited in the vacuole. And therefore, this plant will survive. There is also what is known as cross resistance. Resistance to a number of herbicides due to only one resistance mechanism. You can have altered the site, target site, and then this can give resistance to many herbicides. Multiple resistance. You've got resistance to two or more herbicides due to the presence of more than one resistance mechanism. For example, ACC case and ALS inhibitors. I mean, if the herbicide affects ALS, it can also affect ACC case. So what I've been trying to explain are the possibilities of how the herbicides uh, become uh, ineffective in some weeds which have developed the uh, resistance. But as I have said, in Zimbabwe, we have not uh, reported the herbicide resistance, but elsewhere they have reported the herbicide resistance. So let us look at the factors affecting the speed at which resistance develops. What actually causes the resistance? It could be number one, the initial frequency of resistance to individuals in the population. The size of the seed population in the seed bank and the length of time seeds remain uh, viable are some of these factors. The susceptibility of the weeds, also the repeated use of herbicide uh, with a single mode of action every year. Use of herbicides with a long period of activity. Use of herbicides with a highly specific single mode of action. And this can lead to resistance. So how can uh, we prevent the herbicide the resistance in weeds? Rotation of herbicides with a different mode of action uh, is necessary. Or we can use herbicide mixtures. We can use herbicides with a different mode of action. We can use herbicides when only necessary. We can control with that is kept uh, control. We should practice sanitation of uh, equipment to prevent uh, the spread of uh, resistant uh, weeds. So we should clean our equipment so that it's free of uh, weed seeds.
we should try to use herbicides with the short residual life. So th this can reduce uh, probably selection uh, pressure. We should scout the fields for resistant uh, weeds. Needed to remove weeds which are not uh, controlled by the chemical. Adapt integrated weed control strategies. Adapt crop rotation. I mean, crop rotation means using a beside program, making it difficult for resistant uh, weeds to increase. Now we come to the interesting uh, issue. What I've been talking about Uh, is happening elsewhere. It's, it's herbicide resistance which has been reported elsewhere. But in this country, we have not uh, reported uh, herbicide uh, resistance. So in Zimbabwe, we have not yet reported uh, resistance. Maybe we have not looked the uh, thoroughly. Probably the herbicide selection pressure is not high enough to bring about a weed population which is resistant to herbicides. What we are saying is that uh, if we are putting a lot of herbicides, maybe we could reach that point, but probably our with control strategies do not permit uh, the build up of such populations with the resistant uh, biotypes. The majority of smallholder farmers still rely on the mechanical methods. Very few farmers are actually using uh, website technology under smallholder farming conditions. Most farmers usually combine mechanical and the chemical methods. The other issue is the weed seed banks could be regulating weed seedling emergence. So few weed species with the genes of resistance could be present in the dominant uh, weed populations. There is need to determine the status of herbicide uh, resistance uh, in Zimbabwe. So I would like to make some uh, conclusions. Uh, pesticide resistance in pest organisms results from uh, using the same pesticide repeatedly. Resistant weeds, insects, and fungi can limit the available management options for crop growers. Resistance can be managed in several ways so that, uh, insect, so that uh, pesticides remain in a useful way of controlling pest organisms now and in future come. Oh. Huh? Four, one, two. Oh, okay. okay, sorry about that. So this is it. Let me stop here. Okay, sorry about that disturbance. 
So this is it on a resistance. So we had to cover all these aspects on insects, uh, pathogens, and uh, and weeds. We have had a lot of experiences in uh, insect pests in Zimbabwe, but not with the weeds. We could have some cases with the fungi. Any experiences with the pest resistance? Personally, I don't have any experience. Anyone need to bag a research board? Grace? Sorry, Doc, can you come again at the network uh, network interference? Okay. We are talking of uh, insect pest resistance. Do you have any in the tobacco research board? Uh, yes, we do. Like, uh, we have aphids that is resist it, it's resistant to certain uh, pests, certain pesticides. But um, for the other insects, I'm not too sure. I'm mostly at the nematology side, but for the entomology side, I'm sure aphids, aphids are resistant to some um, aphicides that are on the market. Okay. So with the aphids, probably aphids have this carboxy stress levels which are very high, which may be causing breakdown of those uh, pesticides. Yeah, I think that that could be a uh, thing. Yeah, it could be that reason. A any issues on the pesticide uh, resistance? Is it from clear? Can you follow the story? Yes, quite clear. Ah, okay. So I think uh, we may meet it tomorrow. Okay, Doc. The same time, two o'clock. Uh, probably what we are going to talk about is uh, pesticide metabolism. It may also enable you to understand uh, more about uh, resistance. So the two are actually linked. I decided to put pesticide metabolism towards the end because sometimes it takes too much time. But this time around, I think I've planned for it. We should be able to go through it nicely. Okay. So we'll meet tomorrow. 82. Is that okay? Yes, but it's okay. So, th th thanks.